Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I'm running through the current version of my Sunday sermon. Oh, what to make of the United States right now? As I listen to different sides, I see two screens, as some people say, two sets of perceived facts. Um, Biden is stealing the election. Uh, There's no evidence for a stolen election. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. A lot of this on on social media. And the problem is, how do we have one nation and one conversation when we see the world in radically different ways? And to say, well, I'm right and they're wrong. Okay, of course you believe you're right. Because if you didn't believe you were right, you'd change your mind. And so then the point is, well, how do we go forward together? Part of why this is happening is that there are too many facts. What do I mean by that? Well, the world is very large and very complex, and we live in a world where now we have this rush of information at us all the time, all over the place. Now in the midst of a pandemic, and Sacramento just went from red to purple, which means more restrictions on indoor activities, et cetera, et cetera. And, well, how are we to make sense of this? Who are we to believe? Um, We hear these calls about the election. Are we to go to every state and find every ballot and track down every voter? Uh, we, We couldn't even do that in the place that you live, whether it be Sacramento or some other town. Um, and so what happens when we're flooded with these, with all of these facts, we need a filter and we need a way to sort of cut through them and decide very quickly because we have to live very quickly. Most of us don't have all day to think about some election. And so then we have these biases and we have people that we trust. And, you know, when I was a boy, Walter Cronkite was someone that a great number of Americans trusted. Of course, not all, but but many across the board. And, and so once you trust someone, well, you're more or less liable to believe that what they say is true and the people that are disagreeing with them, what they say is false. Now, part of the problem of this is that this is also called confirmation bias. We tend to realign the facts as we see them according to what we believe. And often, well, if you believe that what me and my group think is right, well, then we're the good people and the other people are the bad people. And of course you won't trust them because they're bad people. So now when it comes to an election, we wonder who should we trust? Who do we trust? Just today I caught a a video which was a conversation between David Brooks and Katie Couric. And David Brooks was making a a bunch of important statements. Politics is supposed to be a competition between partial truths, Um, and we're asking politics to do too much, more than politics itself can bear. Uh, When it when it comes to um, when politics becomes your identity, any compromise is not just well we we disagree over how we should have health care or how we should spend the money or or what the rate of taxation should be, or what public public policy should be. When politics becomes your identity, then compromise is dishonoring, and it becomes a war of all against all. And community, when David Brooks basically says, you know, community is is mutual love of a thing. Tribalism is mutual hate of another. And unfortunately, we've descended into hate more than more than love in many ways but we say well we we must save the world through through changing public opinion and so we argue and we yell and we and we promote ideas and we feel the need to represent to assert to persuade according to the truth as we see it but then how do we represent the opposition well they're stupid they're uninformed they're they're liars, they're evil, they can't be trusted. What does that mean when it comes to sharing a country with them? Ought one particular party all to be thrown into jail? Ought we to round up everyone who voted for the other candidate this fall? How exactly will you manage this? And this is kind of the pickle we find ourselves in. We've been going through the Ten Commandments, and, you know, my... my, my 
hash of the of the commandments sort of goes as follows. You shall have no other gods before me, the Lord says. Don't create a representation of God from his own creation. Don't lift up God's name upon a lie. Keep a weekly witness to the goal of, of creation, which is Sabbath rest. Prioritize your love of neighbor to... Um, um, to the most godlike neighbor, which are your parents. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. And now we've got don't bear false witness. And, and this one is, again, one of these commandments that seems quite obvious. And as I said last week, really, these four commandments that are very short things seem to sort of revolve around ideal, uh, an idea. Don't steal your neighbor's life by murder. Don't steal your neighbor's wife by adultery. Don't steal your neighbor's person or any persons of your neighbor by kidnapping or just or, or taking their life by manipulating the stuff of this world. And don't steal your neighbor's reputation. You ought to honor your neighbor's reputation. Well, it seems like in our country right now, that is not at all what we seem to be doing. Bearing false witness, um, a little little treatment of it. Some have interpreted this to be a prohibition on lying in general, but that's not really the case. The Hebrew terms here used are forensic connotations. That is, they, they mean proceedings in court. Furthermore, the language here points to a particular type of false statement, a false accusation. You're a thief. You're a liar. You're trying to destroy our community. This prohibition is about wrongful prosecution, specifically coming before a court to initiate a trial and wrongfully accuse another person. That's most specifically what the commandment is about. Now, actually, you find a number of commandments in the Mosaic Law that pretty much explicate this broader. And you'll find similar commandments in other ancient Near East legal documents as well. This is from the book of Deuteronomy. One witness is not, en- is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness takes the, t- takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judge must make a thorough invest the judges must make a thorough investigation. You're looking at the facts, you're looking for evidence. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false te- testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness as that witness intended to be done to the other party. This is where you get an eye for an eye from. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid. But now look, you're not destroying their household. You're not destroying their tribe. You're addressing the individual. The rest of the people will hear this and be afraid and never again do such an evil thing. um, And never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, truth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Pretty brutal. Now, the Heidelberg Catechism, as we've seen throughout this series, and we've been looking at the Heidelberg Catechism's treatment of the Ten Commandments as we've gone through the Ten Commandments, and as we've seen in most all of these commandments, it tends to broaden it. What is the aim of the Ninth Commandment? That I never give false testimony against anyone, twist no one's words, nor gossip or slander, nor join in condemning anyone rashly or without a hearing. Rather, in court and everywhere else, I should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. These are the very devices the devil uses, and they would call down on me God's intense wrath. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. And I should do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's good name. So right there you see this balance. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. It's a good thing to speak the truth as you see it, within the limits of how you know it, but that's a good thing. But at the same time, guard and advance my neighbor's good name. Maybe my neighbor is mistaken about something. Maybe I think they're wrong about a number of things. Okay, it's fine to contest the ideas, but your neighbor's reputation, well, that's important for you to maintain. Now, 
A number of years ago, I read this very interesting book by Jonathan Haidt, who's an evolutionary psychologist. And this actually was the book that he wrote before he wrote a couple of other books that made him quite a bit more famous. And he had a long section in this book about gossip, and that really caught my attention because growing up with the Heidelberg Catechism, I had always known gossip to be a, a fairly negative thing. And, and he, he brings up what's called the Dunbar number. Now, what the Dunbar number says is that, for the most part, our, we have a limited capacity to really productively work with face-to-face -face community of a certain level. We, and he kind of layered this out, we have a support click of like five people usually. These are five people who, who we trust and can speak intimately with and disclose secrets and, and we really trust them deeply. That's our support click. And then there's a sympathy group and these are probably the people that you vent with or complain about other people with. And that's a group of maybe 12 to 15 people. And you can really have meaningful relationships with about... 50 people, and that's about the number of people you can manage, and you'll have active friendships with a group of about 150 people, and this was taken from the invention of friends, the Dunbar number, and the whole video is really quite interesting because they went through thing after thing after thing, finding that in a lot of cases, numbers tend to coalesce around this 150 in terms of sort of the maximum number of relationships or friendships, active friendships, any human being can, can really sustain at a given time. Now, within this, gossip actually functions in a rather important way. We sort of keep score on each other. Um, and, you know, the Chinese have this whole social scorekeeping thing that they're trying to do to control their population. Well, we, we sort of do that naturally one to another. Among, among many of the findings in the book, again, gossip is overwhelmingly critical. We like to tell tales out of school. We like to talk about how such and such has failed. This is what we like to do. Now, obviously, in the days of social media, we're not just doing it face to face and, you know, only people, limited numbers of people had access to things like newspapers. Um, now suddenly via social media, we're just broadcasting it out to the world. And, and so gossip is overwhelmingly critical and it's primarily about the moral and social violations of others. And this is basically what we see playing out today. Now, a second study revealed that most people hold negative views of gossip and gossipers. So on one hand, this is something we do to sort of keep tabs on others. And on the other hand, even though we do it, we don't really think a lot of those who do do it. And, and right there you see sort of a collision, but this, this is designed to sort of keep gossip in check. You know, so we hold negative views of people who gossip or gossipers, but almost everyone gossips. And then we get to scandal. Scandal is great entertainment because it allows people to feel contempt. And we really like feeling contempt because we are status seekers and status trackers. Well, what is contempt? Contempt is a moral emotion that gives um, feelings of moral superiority while asking nothing in return. So we have contempt for our political rivals. We have contempt for those who are enemies in one form or another. We have contempt for, and this feels good because we love status and we feel ourselves their moral superiors. And so then we talk them down in front of other people and we talk them down. With contempt, you don't need, um, you don't need to right the wrong, as with anger, or to flee the scene, as with fear or disgust. And best of all, contempt is made to share. Stories about the moral failings of others are among the most common kinds of gossip. They are a staple of talk radio, and they offer a ready way for people to show that they share a common moral orientation. I'm on team right. I'm on the right side of history. They're on the wrong side of history. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. And this game just blows up, and it's mostly prosecuted by telling bad stories, and repeating all of the wrong things others have done. Tell an acquaintance a cynical story that ends with both of you smirking and shaking your heads, and voila, you've got a bond. You've got a tribe. And this is what we do. Now, 
Like all of these commands, these commands scale. It's relatively easy to avoid making a false accusation against someone in a legal matter. Very few of us go through the trouble of filing a police report against our neighbor. And we also know that in our country as well, there are legal consequences for filing a false police report. But going and talking amongst your friends or going on social media to talk someone down, it's not against the law. A lot of people won't basically charge you with libel. All the drama around legal actions, oath-taking, and perjury and penalties are not perfect, but they, they do their work, and they pretty much discourage us from running to court with a whole lot of things. But we're fairly mindless chattering gossips. We, we do so to try to keep our herd together and to keep life order, orderly. We try to be good members of our tribe, good members of our teams, and we try to show up and, and be accounted among the faithful and the righteous of at least those who think like we do. We cooperate in order to compete. There is a herd out there that we are competing with. It's a political party, it's a nation, it's a sports team. Any marker that can be used to identify a group and identities are created and then defended. Now, we might look at these World War II posters and say, oh, these are racist. This, we would never draw a picture like this about, about another group. Really? Well, maybe we're not drawing pictures accentuating certain aspects, but often we destroy someone's status we destroy someone's image, we destroy someone's reputation to basically justify doing other more damaging, dangerous things down the road. Now, this is not a new thing. This is a very old thing, and public opinion can turn on a dime. On Palm Sunday, they welcomed Jesus as Hosanna, son of David, into Jerusalem. Now, some of the they might have changed, but by Friday, Sunday, there was one crowd yelling, Hosanna, welcome. Friday, there was another crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Jerusalem didn't break out into a civil war. And, and, and who was this Jesus? Now, if you read the Gospels, pretty much everybody agreed he was a miracle worker. Was he the Messiah? Well, that was what was subject to, for debate. He was a rabbi. But many of his enemies felt he was soft on the Roman occupation. That was the true evil in their world, and, and any good Jew should be against it. And in order to rally public opinion, they were going to enforce some things and discourage other things, and Jesus just kind of seemed soft on it. He was a friend of sinners and tax collectors, and the particular kind of sin that they had in mind were political sins. Jesus wasn't really down sufficiently for certain groups of people because, well, he that one woman who comes to the house of the Pharisee to, to, to wash Jesus' feet with her tears, she was a sinful woman. Well, well, she may very well have been a prostitute, some woman who had, you know, lost her family and was reduced to the sex trade. And, well, the Pharisees were pretty much stern about, you know, they're really very hard line-ish on the Jewish girl sex trade. And here Jesus doesn't seem to be holding the line with them. And then he goes and eats at the home of tax collectors. In fact, one of his, one of his inner circle, Matthew or Levi, was himself a tax collector. Jesus meets Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going to your house. And everybody's, well, Jesus was going to eat and befriend and gain and give somehow moral support to the wrong political party. Now, Jesus was not lined up to end the Roman corruption and purify God's promised land the way they imagined he should have. Now, how are we supposed to live with these things? Well, in a bunch of these commandments, we try to manage little things so they don't become too big. We watch our anger to avoid murder. We watch our lust to avoid adultery. We watch our greed to avoid theft. One of the things we really need to do is to watch how we talk, characterize, and represent others, especially those of another political party, another race, another class. You know who your enemy is. How do we talk about 
your political rival. To avoid tribing up to justify violence, disenfranchisement, marginalization, and genocide. Because things can go quite quickly in these ways. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, what does that mean? It means if someone has skin on them, they are not finally your enemy. They are your brother or your sister. Now, what are we going to do with this broader world that we have? Because there is a social cost for not engaging in the game. As I've said before, politics is now and religion is always. And as hot as this election feels to be, four years from now, that one will feel hot. Four years ago, that one felt hot. Forty years ago, that one felt hot. They always feel hot. That's the nature of politics. What's interesting is that Jesus picked 12 disciples from across their culture war spectrum. He had a tax collector. He had some probably middle of the road, you know, fairly religious people. Peter, James, and John seemed to be disciples of John the Baptist. And, well, John the Baptist seemed to be one of these bunker individuals that lived out in the desert and prayed for God's intervention and had some questions when Jesus didn't seem to quite be doing that. And then we don't know, but Judas Iscariot might have been even more radical in terms of wanting to kick the Romans out. That could have motivated his betrayal of Jesus, that Jesus, in the end, didn't seem to quite fulfill what Judas imagined Jesus should do. So he sold Judas out for 30 pieces of silver. The truth is, people will always have a political opinion, and we should recognize that. Um, some will be right and some will be wrong. There are people on two sides of the Revolutionary War in the United States. There are people on both sides of the American Civil War. There were people on both sides of the Vietnam War. Politics burns hot in the moment, but passions subdue in time and different tribes realign and on and on and on politics goes. And if you make politics your religion, in many ways you'll be captive to the moment and you'll be perpetually tempted to basically violate this commandment. What we see in the story of Jesus is something quite remarkable because Jesus knew how to navigate a culture war. In fact, Jesus used the culture war to make points about what was beyond the culture war of that moment to look at a much greater struggle that endures through history. We battle not against flesh and blood. Just now notice how the different political sides are exemplified just in this one story. This is the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals. Now again, Jesus is being crucified by the Romans, who are the sworn enemies of many of those who brought Jesus to them to be crucified. In other words, these two warring aspects could agree on perhaps only one thing, that the world would be better without Jesus. And so when Pontius Pilate offered them Barabbas, a known revolutionary, they cried out, give us Barabbas. We want to see Jesus dead. And crucifixion was the chosen way of, of the Romans to make a political example out of someone. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Who's they? Both sides who are crucifying him. And they divided up his clothes by lot. The people stood watching, and even and the rulers even sneered at them. In other words, everybody's enjoying the death of Jesus, even if they hate one another. Now suddenly, the scapegoat here makes them one. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there insult, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Because, well, 
what was Messiah supposed to do? Messiah was supposed to kick out the Romans. What better time? And all of our Hollywood movies would have shown something like this. Jesus would, in a flash of light, the nails would dissolve. He would come down from the cross. Laser eyes would go out of his head and kill all the soldiers. And he'd free the others. And they would all rise up and grab the Roman soldiers that were huddled in the Antonia Fortress and cleanse Jerusalem. And, and, and one city after another, the Romans and their sympathizers would die and there'd be a glorious revolution and Jesus would be king. But there he is on a cross. And then the other criminal, and see again, the, 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 the NIV here, criminal, no, the other insurgent, the other revolutionary, the other one trying to unseat Rome, says to the other one, don't you fear God? Well, they're about to meet God. They're both likely very religious, conservative Jews. And don't you fear God? What do you mean fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, you too are hanging on a cross. We are being punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. It's probably sedition, probably treason. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's a pretty amazing request for one man on a cross to another. What did that revolutionary see in Jesus or even know about him in terms of his reputation? Jesus' answer is even more shocking. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. No remorse, no sinner's prayer, just welcome. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun, sun, sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion so we just saw someone hanging on the cross, probably there for trying to overthrow the Roman government and the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, sees Jesus and asks Jesus to invite him into his kingdom and hear a centurion, a Roman. Not only did Jesus have them in his inner circle, now he has them right there at the cross. Seeing what had happened, praising God, and said, surely, this was a righteous man. This is what he sees by the manner in which Jesus endures his torturous execution. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, wasn't cheers, wasn't yay for our side, they beat their breasts and went away. Who really won? that day. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. That should include us. We're standing at a distance. We're watching these things. We're in the midst of a divisive moment in this world, and it is so tempting to line up the good guys and the bad guys, and oh, guess what? You and your team are the good guys, and the other team are the bad guys. You might be right. I'm sure you think you are. I think I am. That's what it means to be human. The other team thinks they're right too. So argue the facts, argue the points, have a good conversation, let politics be politics, but do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Certainly not in court. Tell the truth as you see it, but try to honor your neighbor's good name and treat them as an image bearer because we finally, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That's what we should do.